Many people have problems with art and not with reality. So why is art different? It's pretty simple, right? This is knowledge, this is thinking, this is thought. Yeah, it does something strange with your head. Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. Bring it. Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. My name is Ondo. Hi everybody, how are you guys doing? Man, it's nice to be back. I know it's been a long time. We are just out of some sort of summer temporal time swirl of sorts, and uh, it's discombobulating. Actually, what happened is I, I quit my job. I went out of the country for four weeks. I started a new business, and now I'm organizing a booth at an arts festival. So, yeah, it's also been hard to get a hold of artists. They've all been on vacation, too, because we live in socialist Europe. Today we have a great guest on. I've been trying to get him on for a long time, and it turned out better than I could have ever hoped. Søren Benke is here. It was a real pleasure to get to know him and his work. It kind of only recently dawned on me how great his work is, and that's through my own combination of uh, you know timing and ignorance, basically. I'd never really known his work, but uh, hot damn, it's good. So he's here to help dispel my own ignorance, and uh, if you don't know him, then yours as well. You are going to love getting to know him. He also recently released a book which kind of functions as an overview of his practice for the last 15 years or so, and it's really, really good. You can follow the links on the uh, show notes page for this episode to cop it. It's splendid, and it'll ignite some nice discussions around your coffee table. I guarantee it. So I mentioned the booth at an art festival and uh, that's happening already next week. That's the deal, folks. The Undergang Armchair has a 10 square meter booth at the new Code Art Fair here in town. It'll be at Bella Center, and we'll be there live streaming talks with artists and otherwise engaging with the public. You can come and have a seat with us. You can see what sort of craziness we're up to, and uh, I'll put a link to that on the show notes for this page, too. Come and check it out. The, the fair is brand new. There's a ton of international galleries, and as far as I can tell, it's going to be really good. And don't forget to go by Chart 2. That's the same weekend. Two fairs, one weekend. Actually, three fairs. There's also the uh, Photo Collect Fair at the Museums Buchning in Ustable. So uh, look at Copenhagen. It's all grown up now. So I'll see you guys there. And in the meantime, enjoy my talk with Søren Benke. able to have this feeling about a language is just so fucking powerful yeah and it's so great when you're traveling out in the world that you can have it's a little this. secret that you yeah, know it's so great you're just a part of the, yeah. the party like that yeah yeah you don't yeah. have to think about it uh be nervous about it or anything you just go into it well i mean it's it's funny we were kind of talking about it a little bit before we came in here the the whole thing about you're at this really interesting point in your life now where you have a, a, a new freedom which you didn't have before and so now there's all these options exactly what are you going to do you just had a big solo show a yeah. new one so you don't have to have a show you know for the next year probably or something and you you know you could live anywhere you want you could do anything you want it's kind of like a new renaissance in a way. Or something. It's like what that you said before in the kitchen when we were drinking coffee. That I'm a teenager again. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're moving away <laughs> and, from uh, home. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, but uh, but it's true. And the funny thing is, I mean, uh, I've been thinking about this point of my life in ten years. I've been looking forward to it, but my ideas about it then was totally different. Then, I mean, not totally different, but time is changing things yeah. and uh, so now um, that i'm here it's, it's like you said wow what to choose what to do i had this dream now i have to live it uh, so i have to uh, get organized is it with is it scary too mm, no it's no not scary it's most a little confusing yeah uh, in a good way i think yeah. Yeah. yeah i have to you know get focused and all this now i have to okay now i'm here just like getting off the train someplace that you had to want to go to for years and years, and now you're getting off the train and then it's in the, uh, standing on the station and right. okay, where to go Shit, now? What do I really do? Yeah, you know? what, what do I do now? I'm here, you know. And uh, no, so well, that was kind of the same for me moving to Denmark. 
yeah. because I had thought about it for many years. And then I got here, and in reality, any plan I'd made was complete bullshit and fell apart within like you know two minutes. I got there and I was like, oh okay, and then I was just like, oh, I guess I'm not doing that then. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so I started yeah. washing dishes at IBM in Aarhus. That yeah. was the first thing I did when I yeah. got here. Yeah. Because that was the reality of it, you exactly. know. Exactly, yeah. But that's good, too. You get thrown, like, to throw yourself into a situation where you don't know what will happen. Yeah, you learn things. It's it's great. It's always good to throw yourself into something mm-hmm. that you don't, that you have an idea about, maybe. But uh, you, it's never what you think it is. Nope. The planning gets you nowhere. I mean, and, and I, no, it does. But but I mean, it's just a good uh, thing to be able to just adapt or just you know, it, it's still I guess the same ground idea that you have. Right. But the system just the reality is just a little different than you thought. But that's not the same as a, that you can't uh, live your dream. You just maybe have to right. uh, focus in another way. Or, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, let's set it up. So you've lived for now how many years in Aarhus? You were there for 20, 30 years? Well, I'm from, uh, originally I'm from down south of Denmark. I have a German father from Hamburg and a Danish mother. And uh, when I was, I went out of public school and then I just went north immediately. Right. And Which is the largest city in that area. It's yeah. the only real city, I guess. Yeah, you the second, second biggest city in Denmark, yeah. which is still a small city. <laughs> <clears throat> but Indeed. well, yeah, I went to Aarhus when I was sixteen, seventeen. That's a great city to be seventeen years old in. For me, it was just enormous and and so great, and right. just everything was new and big and and totally different from where I came from, and full of possibilities and kind of people that I never seen before. And mm. it was just in the, you know the last year or two of the punk area. I've been grown up with the. Mainly doing three, three, three things: uh, playing soccer, uh, drawing a lot, and uh, playing music a lot. Mm. So I started uh, when I went to O's as uh, seventeen. I immediately went into a punk group. I I have a background as a jazz uh, drum player. Mm. Um, I mean, my my um, my parents were. Uh, what's the word in English? My father was. Uh, you know the the guys who are putting bricks on bricks on the houses. Oh, bricklayer, bricklayer, yeah. yeah. And uh, my mother worked in a, a children's garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was very much blue collar working working folk. Yeah, just working people, kind yeah. of. Yeah, I guess. And uh, and uh, but my mother especially had this uh, naive and romantic idea of the arts and just loved the musicians. And so and and. Uh, and also, also the artist, but and she had some kind of idea that her children maybe could be musicians. So we learned that we, you know, we went to to music schools, learned play piano and guitar, and then I picked up the drums later. And and um, my folks were very much into jazz music first and foremost, and then uh, classical music. They didn't like beat music at mm-hmm. all, mm-hmm. and uh, they were like political engaged with all this Vietnam War thing and later the Chile thing and all this mm. when it was a child. So they're very left wing you could say. And they are, yeah. Um and I know uh, I remember our home there was a lot of drawings with the, from a German artist called Horst Janssen. I don't know how he's from Hamburg. I don't know how the Germans look at him, but he's a good drawing guy. Mm. And uh, so so did that already at that point kind of wake you up to the idea of there's such a thing as artists, there's such a thing as a job that is called making art? Uh, no, not art. I, no, I, 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 I was up in my 30s before I really realized what this being an artist would be. I never focused on that. I always focused on the, the doing, Yeah, uh, if that's a word. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the drawing and things. So I'm this kind of uh, guy that just learned to draw things like photography in a very early age, but I was never really fascinated about that thing. Right. I've, for me, it has always been, I don't want, know what the word, the word is like, the, 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 the language of pictorial something. Right. You know? The actual technique, the practice. Yeah, the, the different languages in this. I mean, I'm, you know, we all start out doing this doodle, 
boom, that's the first thing. We all have that in common. Then we go to kindergarten and we learn to draw there's a horizon and the sun up in the corner and and we come to school and we learn more and we all do that until certain age, maybe 10 years. And then a lot of people stop doing this for different reasons, mostly because they can make it work for them right. in the way they want to. Right. And it's mostly that they can... They can draw it like a photography. That's right. The, right. They <laughs> want to make something that they can't make, and they don't. Yeah, and they don't then practice ah, fuck to do that. It. But yeah. for some reason, some people, me included, just have such enjoyment doing these drawings. Hmm. So I did a lot of drawing all the time, and did a lot of comics, starting out with some superheroes, and later went into Robert Crumb and all these things. You know. Wait, wait, wait! wait. How did that happen? How did you find <laughs> Robert Crumb and uh, uh, you know the comics from 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 all this American underground right, show, showed up in, and, yeah, all this showed up in Denmark in uh, the, somewhere in the seventies, I guess. So the all the you know the people who were older than me uh, and my parents' age actually they they collected these and so I I saw these comics. That's kind of mind blowing, right? Ah, it was so great and it was so playful and it was so crazy and it was so you know uh, imaginative yeah. and it was really I really loved it. So for me, it was always a kind of just a good place to go mm. to draw right. and and watch uh, comics. And the comics, I guess, were very big in back in the eighties. Changed a little now. It's now. It's, I mean, this was before the internet and before cell phones and. Uh, Uh, mobile phones and all this. That's the thing. People forget how hard it was to find things sometimes. I remember that in the, even in the We early didn't. 90s, you know, like... Yeah, but you, the thing is you don't... You didn't think about it in that way back then. I didn't. I mean, uh, it was really a thing that you could go to this one uh, shop every once a month because that came this fucking magazine. Right. All these things. Disney doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so things just change. I mean, the internet's great. You can find everything. And, and, and But back then, it was just... The whole thing was in another... Uh, what's the word? Yeah, well, there wasn't that... We didn't expect anything right. like that, like we do now. But that's why it was such a surprise sometimes. Because you'd be, you'd be, you know, just minding your own business one day, and then someone would show you something you had no idea existed... Exactly, and you just be like, duh, you know, like yeah. I've never seen anything. Yeah, like totally this. new doors right. open, right? Here. And you're like, where do I get this? What's going on? Like, yeah. what the fuck? Like, yeah, you know? that's great. I want to go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so great. I guess yeah. that's the thing about being young, though. Too, even now, exactly. I guess you can yeah. find stuff online or yeah. whatever. Well, that's the thing. You should just keep on having this right. feeling and this seeking right. and this, yeah, yeah. And it, I, I still see it all the time. I'm, I must say, just in a different way. Yeah, it is there. I just have to. I mean, all kinds of stupid things I didn't know. Mm. I, I, I think. I, I mean, also, you know, when when you're growing old, you have have had to at some point take some decisions about not being a professional soccer player or not being an electrician or something else. And then maybe ten, twenty years later, you meet somebody who did another choice and right. maybe have been an electrician for 20 years and and you figure out that wow that's what this, it could this have been. is really crazy this guy knows so much and understands things that i just don't understand it's a little magic for me and little little secret because yeah. he knows these things yeah, yeah. it's like uh, you know when you first when you first uh, figure out how the alphabet is working and all of a sudden there are signs everywhere that you can read right before it was just some blah 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 right uh, so it's so in some way it's still like that i think but well, it is the thing about choices it's just like you're saying now but right now you have so many opportunities and that means you have to make you have to you, you have can to go say only i can way. only do this i yeah. can't do it all yeah you have just to yeah But it sounds like you did it all when you were in Aarhus, when you were 17. So you're playing soccer, you're drawing, you're in a punk Oh, I band. stopped playing soccer when I was... I mean, I, I played since I could walk, and then up till I was maybe 12 or something, okay. 13 maybe. So mm. like 10 years or something. Did I you? still like it a lot. Mm. But I mean, then come rock and roll and, and, and girls and all uh -huh. these things. And <laughs> that's what happened to my sports career. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened to most sports career. I mean, when you get 12, 13 years, it's just the time where things are changing. You have to right. make it's It's stopped being a game and play, and it's getting serious. Right. It's starting to somehow, it has to be a career. You have to go to 
soccer school and things. Right. Practice every and day. And so it's a, just a kind of normal thing there, right. that, uh, a natural thing that you have to choose about. Well, that's the thing you can, you know, what happened to me, I was like, I don't know, 15 or 16. And it was like, okay, you can go to practice every day, work really hard, and maybe you'll be hopefully kind of as good as everybody else. Or you can learn about smoking weed and chasing <laughs> girls and listening to music and hanging out with your friends. Yeah, and it was exactly. like, well, yeah, I think I know what I'm going to do here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. playing music, of course, is a whole different <clears throat> milieu, you know, that whole thing. Uh, it's, the, the nice thing I always like so much is the, the band thing. Mm. I mean, it's it's not... I mean, I've been to music school for years and years and years, and it's nice to learn playing instruments and so forth and so on. But what I really loved always is being in a band and doing this communication with people uh, uh, through the music. It's, right. That's just... I, you know, that's, uh, I haven't experienced that anywhere else, actually. It is a special kind of uh, teamwork. It is, really. Yeah. Say. And it's not teamwork like a soccer team. It's, uh, oh. it's teamwork like, I don't know, someone building a building or something. You know, like you're, you're, you're together and you're yeah, all maybe, pushing in the yeah, same it's, direction. It's, it's a group thing. It's uh, like making some kind of poetry together. Yeah. I don't know. It's... I mean, I, I I grew up with the as a, as I told you earlier, like doing the jazz drums and the jazz music is very open to, um, I mean to to uh, everybody can have their own voice. Now you have a solo, then can he have a solo? And right. also, so it's uh, everybody can get some space to be themselves some way, right. and uh, everybody picks up uh, each other's idea and, and developing. And so, yeah, it's it's so great. Yeah, it's a lot of experimentation, too. Yeah, um, jazz is good for that. But you mentioned earlier that you uh, you didn't really start making... Well, you made art from day one, but you didn't start considering a career no. or like art as a, as a job, essentially, until your 30s. What happened in between there? I mean, I, I figured out you were a graphic designer for some years. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I did that for some years. For I had my own studio for six, seven years, and uh, until I got bored with that. Mm. And um, was that old school graphic design when you were cutting things in hand and layering, or was that? No, actually, yeah, both. I mean, it, I went into the graphic uh, design business when the Macintosh mm -hmm. just came into mm -hmm. business. So it was just uh, it was just the beginning with all that and the uh, new possibilities. And uh, but still, it was all about doing something by hand and putting it into the machine. Right. Uh, and what uh, there was this. Um, uh, this thing in the in the in this beginning of the nineties, the kind of graphical revolution that started in the U.S. and uh, became big, and where you just you know started to questioning all the the the, the rules of uh, graphic design, uh, which way you had to read and, uh, and what kind of paper, and, you know, why is a letter a letter and all kinds of things, and it was really fun being in that business in the 90s. Right. And it was very playful, and I'm always very playful about what I do, whatever I do. Mm. Uh, that's just my, my drive. That's why. I, that's the reason uh, why I do the, what I do. And uh, and it was so, the, this, like, 10 years was very funny being there, and then just thing got bored. Wow. And... Uh, at that point, and then I was in the beginning of the 30s, and it was the first time that I really considered, okay, I have these, and I want to do this now. I have these ideas, and like you said, I I never thought of being an artist. I was always thinking about uh, doing my, my thing. But where can I do my, you know, uh, do the ideas? Right. Where can I work with this or that idea? Were you and looking have, at art at the same time? Were you going to Aros or... Yeah, you know? always. Yeah, I always liked art and not so, I mean, like everybody else somehow. Was that feeding ideas? Yeah, like everything else, I should say. Yeah. Like, you know, like design or like music or all kinds of uh, different places because i noticed personally if i don't look at art i start to lose my own engagement with art in a weird way like my ideas don't they come from interacting with the world very much and and if i don't interact with things 
you know, art world, but also other things, other culture, other people, etc. I just, it starts to go away. I can feel it yeah. disappearing. For me, I think maybe it's a little like this Macintosh machine, you know? You have to know the machine, but in order to, to developing this machine, you have to grab things outside the machine and put it into it. Mm, and, yeah. So it has to go in that direction. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have to... Well, I, I, I think it's... I like this machine, this art thing. I think it's so interesting what, what all the all other artists are doing and what the art history has, uh, what there is there to get. And uh, But but in the same time, I try to um, yeah get my material somewhere else also. Right. But, yeah. So what, what exactly happened? You closed your studio and then you were like, okay, I guess I'm going to try to make a career in the arts? Or, or how yeah, no, I didn't. It, it wasn't that. Uh, in, 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 yeah, well, kind of. You know, I, I did a lot of things before I did the graphic thing. Also, I had some years where I was doing, I was, um, you know, illustrator for newspapers and, mm -hmm. and put out some comics too. And right, you made a couple of comics. I made fairly a different. Now. Also, you know, daily comics for newspapers and and, and all kinds of projects and. Um, Some years I did. I built. I only built machines like like Tingley, just in a different way. Mm. And uh, had some jobs, made some uh, window decorations and whatever shows with that. And so I've I've really done a lot of things. Different Making things. shit constantly. It's exactly, and, and constantly. all the time changing. Actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, never, never really just one thing. And uh, it has been, you know, a coin with two sides. It has been. A The one side was, yeah, I can do everything. The other side is that people don't know who you are because you're constantly changing. That's a big problem in the art world. Is yeah, that it people is. want to know, want to say, oh, that's that guy. That's They don't what recognize that guy you does. anymore. Yeah. Who, who the hell is that? Is that this guy too? Yeah. Oh, you know, so yeah, that's it's a hard. kind of problem in mm. some way. I don't, yeah. Where I don't like to look at things as problems, but it, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a negotiation. Yeah, so, yeah, again. something <laughs> like that. Yeah, but it's true. It's it's a problem. <laughs> but where does where does uh, street art fit in? Yeah, well, like you said, I, I just I closed my studio. It, it 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 bored me so much, and I had all these ideas that I wanted to do instead. And I was looking uh, at a platform where I could just do these things, which I couldn't do as a graphic designer. And um, so I put a pile of money together. And then I closed the shop and then I, you know, I had this pile of money that I could use to, and that bought me some time just to try to work with these ideas. And the ideas were in two directions. The one, the one thing was about to work with, with painting. I had some uh, things that I had to figure out, some experiments and some playful ideas. Mm. And the other thing was trying to, Uh, do sculptures in uh, in public uh, in in the streets and uh, I remember I had some there was a, a, a artist group in Aarhus called uh, Solkorsen at that time and they were doing um, installation art and that was the first time I met some uh, artists that I didn't hate <laughs> for, <laughs> because I till then I really always thought that artist I will never become an artist these idiots Jesus fucking assholes, assholes. all of them <laughs> all, yeah really you know everything is about themselves and yeah. nothing is about ideas or, yeah. or art and uh, but all of a sudden they, these guys showed up and did this installation art thing and I really love it mm. and I thought it was so great and mind blowing and never seen anything like that so it was so inspiring And for years and years, I thought, why don't these guys do something more in the street? Uh, because there's this whole space, uh, and uh, you know, in the in the late '80s and and, and uh, beginning of the '90s, there was not such a thing in Denmark, nowhere, right. uh, especially not in Aarhus. Mm. Uh, so it was like a totally blank canvas. You had the whole space to yourself, just waiting for It's you. So strange. And so, and it was just a coincidence, uh, somehow. So, and I thought, why, why don't they do anything in the street? They never did. So at that point, I thought, well, then I'll do it. 
That's the magic moment. Yeah. If they're not going to do it, then motherfucker, I'll I will do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a really, for, for Dane, it's a, it's a really 1980s attitude. Because in Denmark, there was a, you know, the, the last economic crisis was in the 80s. And my generation just grew up having no fucking job. Right. And no matter what you did, you can't get a job. So you really just have to find out what the hell should I do then. Was everybody just on uh, welfare and yeah, just exactly. fucking hanging yeah. out? And the thing is that a lot of people couldn't handle that. Right. Because you have to just figure out everything yourself. Unless you really have a lot of ideas and things you want to do, like I had. So these 10 years of the 80s was just, my education was paid off by the state in the, in the, in the kind of school that I just, you know, developed myself. And I could do all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things, as long as I didn't, you know, drunk myself to death or something like that. That's where Denmark is the absolute best. It's still the same today. If you have ideas and stuff you want to do, this may be the best country in the world to do it. Nice. It literally is because they, you know, you can get support, you can get space, you can get, a, a, you know, you can live a life without worrying about if I break my leg, am I going to lose my house? You know, any of that sort of stuff. Yeah, I really agree. But, But if the, you don't have any idea what to exactly. do, it's a really terrible place to yeah, be. Yeah, it's, it's a downside of it that it's really difficult really to help people. Yeah. Because first and foremost, they ha have to be able to help themselves mm -hmm. and then get some help. Yeah. Well, but I was lucky. I consider myself lucky at least. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, well, if they don't do it, I will do it. And um, so I had to like get this money to uh, last so, as long as, as possible. And I had this uh, four year old child that I had to buy food and, you know, the basic things. But uh, I, 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 I was seeking for material that was like cost nothing like we did in the 80s. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of material in uh, such a rich country as Denmark. So I uh, had a lot of friends who went to the uh, architect school in Aarhus, and I saw them doing these buildings, models with cardboard. Right, right, and I right. thought, this is my material. Not the same cardboard. They're, they're using this um, right, the foam core, core yeah. this very expensive thing. But uh, it's in, in, the, in principle, it's the same as just normal cardboard. And, um, and you know, it, in a... Such an organized country as Denmark, the cardboard is collected in containers. So right, it's just sitting it's there. It's just everywhere, you know, and it <laughs> costs nothing. It's very easy to handle. Yeah. You don't need a, kind of, no machines. It doesn't make any noise. It, it's just, you know, perfect material to make sculptures right. and to just, you know, lay flat out and use as a cardboard mm. uh, and now as a canvas. Mm. So, and uh, the one side, I, I used it as a canvas, and the other side, I, I started working in the street uh, with these sculptural ideas. And so you did it simultaneously? You did both? I did both, yeah. yeah. I, it's like, you know, the one thing was more like uh, out in public in action, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the other thing was like uh, being a, what do I know, a writer, just private, you alone private, in your studi yeah. studio for hours and hours and days and days alone. So it is uh, kind of opposite things so that that seemed very that that worked good for me and because that the the, the i mean um, that nobody was in the street in denmark at that point or at least very few people i uh, i remember was when i when i was still doing a, a daily cartoon for a newspaper yeah, it was uh, the first uh the first season where husk midnown another danish artist who started in the street uh was on the street and the year after I went on the street too mm -hmm. and uh, I met him I saw I saw this kind of work uh, for the first time with his work and um, I um, saw him here at, in, in Copenhagen I, I worked for for newspaper that that uh, that was here in Copenhagen and I uh, put his work into my cartoon Oh. Uh, and uh, and then, then I start uh, writing him, and our you know uh, this uh, this talk came into my uh, daily uh, newspaper strip, and at a point I just told him that I was doing this, and then I visited him, and uh, you know, and uh, then then a year after I, I went uh, in the streets myself with this sculpture idea. Mm. So just to say that uh, at the beginning we were maybe. 
five right. people. Right. And so you got all the tension, all the attention that you could possibly ever want to. So was there a lot of attention right uh, from the beginning? Yeah, extremely. Okay. You know, like television and newspapers. and oh, wow. Because that's, that was the new thing. And unlike Husmiel, you weren't anonymous. It was just pure luck. I mean. Well, that and you were the first people to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, I mean, I I just did things the way I always have done things. Right? Right. Like it's good timing. Yeah, yeah. You need a good timing, some luck, and of course, you need to work. Right. You always need to work, mm-hmm. and uh, so that was really nice. I mean, all this scene is just tra- changed today, and it's a diff- totally different thing. But at that moment, it was really uh, interesting, and uh, so I could do this work without any costs, almost. And uh, so I have never went to uh, an art academy or anything. I just started doing it. And uh, and uh, I did what everybody else in Denmark can do, or maybe in all countries. I don't know how the system works elsewhere. But, you know, you can uh, put some work, send some work to some uh, big group shows. Right, censored exhibitions. Exactly. Uh, you're talking about the ones here in Copenhagen? Yeah, example. yeah. yeah for example. Yeah, the, I, so in... I think it was in 2002 or maybe three. I can't really remember now, but I sent uh, I sent my work to three different of these censored shows and I went in to all of them mm. with all my work and I sold it all. So it was like, wow, is it really Holy that easy? shit, man. And I know you I said, well, it was it was a time where the money was really growing. Right, that was, was when, that, when art became very popular in Denmark. Also, yeah, right? and, and people t- all of a sudden have money again. Right, I, they really had money, and um, so there was c- kind of different things that just uh, went off at the same time. It was so lucky. Mm. So I had this country that all of a sudden have a lot of money, and people start buying art. And I was on the street, was with only a few others. Right, you'd been on television, you'd been. Uh, yeah, so it was really, and you know, it's it's like it, I guess it's like it's always been since Hans Christian Andersen or something, that uh, you, as an artist, you, you you live off the rich people. And uh, so you are very... It's important that some of the great collectors or something it just supports you yeah. at the at the beginning yeah. as best. And I was so lucky that that was the case. And so very, very soon I started to do, make some money off it. And uh, I just... Again, I just met the right people. I met the guys who opened V1 Gallery, which is still my gallery here in, Cop- here in Copenhagen. They were just beginning. They didn't know either that they were going into professional Right, they art. had that tiny little gallery yeah, there in yeah. Vesterbro. And it was just, just like me. It was just a thing that I had to try out to yeah. see where is this going. I just have to do it. I don't know where I'm going. I just, you know, yeah. um, I'm figuring it out as I go along here. But this is fun. I want to do this and see what is happening. If I do this, what the hell is going? What is what is happening? And so it's and they they were the same path at that time, and so it was funny because one year later I have hadn't just I just met Huskmit now and at that project we talked together. I mean I remember visiting his uh, little studio that he had together with other people just around the corner from mm. here where you live. And just had a talk, and then I had I didn't see him for a year. I mean, I lived in Aarhus, and uh, all of a sudden we both went into V1 Gallery. Right. And hey, I know you. That, that was their focus. <laughs> right. To, to uh, that was uh, to you know to take the people who worked on the street right. in, in Denmark uh, and in the US uh, and uh, around in the world. So. Yeah. Yeah, and the rest is history. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think it's. I think it kind of illustrates something which is really important for anybody who's trying to make art or trying to get involved in the art world is that you have to find a wave. You have to find something because there's always something happening somewhere. And if nothing's happening where you are, it may not necessarily just be, be your own fault. It could also be you aren't with the right critical mass of people doing something interesting, you know, so you link up with who's now another artist. And then all of a sudden there's a gallery there. Who's really interested in this kind of work. You guys are clearly the only people doing it. You know, that whole thing, that's how it works. You have to get into something. Yeah. And if you can't get into something, you have to make something, 
you yeah. know, and it, it, yeah. like you can work your whole life just making drawings at home yeah. and get nowhere without engaging, you know, and people call it networking and say, but it's all your friends and bullshit. But the truth is there is some sort of, it's like playing in a band. Like you said earlier, there's some sort of energy that comes with working in that group. Yeah. And that, that'll carry you a long ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so true. And, and the, the funny thing about it, when I think about it now, I, I mean, now it all seems so clear and logic. But I always try to maintain some of the, what's the word, you know, the the, the way I did it back then. Would you call not it, knowing? Would anything. you call it naivete? Yeah, it's yeah. maybe that, and and something. I mean, of course, it's about networking, all these things, but it's also just about doing it. I mean, that's the first thing. Right. Do it. Right. And uh, of course. Uh, if there's nothing happening where you are, you can do t- you can do two things. You can move yourself, or you can do it yourself, or right. you can both. Right. Maybe you should do both. Just it's, do it. Right. And then uh, uh, you know, make the networking speak to people, and uh, because you might learn something. Right. <laughs> and like there's been there's been several people on this show who were working on art and didn't like you know what is, uh, nothing was really happening. So they found a little space to show art in and showed them and their friends art. Yeah. You know, because you can do that. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to wait for the no. a gallery to no. say, okay, we're going to sell your work. Or I mean, I, I, one of the reasons I didn't. Uh, you know, try to get into the art academy is that I was getting too fucking old. Mm. I mean, I had to get all kinds of special treatment to at all get in there because it's only for fucking young people. Right. They only want. And the when fresh. I figured that out, I thought, "Fuck this school! I do it myself, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can read a book. I can talk to people. I can go to uh, to readings. I right. can do all the same things. Right. It's all if there. I, if I, yeah, it's still there. It's not that it's disappeared because I'm not into the school. So it's just up to me. To, to make the to, yeah to make the work, but that's interesting because it seems like you did in your work at a certain point really get into art history and discussions with other artists. You know, I was yeah. looking at your work and you have everything from you know Picasso to Marimekko, yeah. the Finnish textile designer. Exactly. You know, yeah. and so obviously you're doing your homework, you're doing your research. Yeah, I mean, I just I just love art, you know. So it's, it's it's I just love reading about these things, all these ideas, all this fucking great art. I mean, yeah, it's a never ending, and and that's a good thing. Did you spend? Did you did you? I mean, do you spend a lot of time looking at art history? Looking at yeah, I mean, it's there's never enough time, is there? <laughs> but um, I have some uh, part of my practice is. Is uh, to traveling twice a year with this uh, mobile printing uh, studio, you could call it, mm-hmm. it's printing praxis. Um, it's a very simple concept. It's it's me and um, my printmaker, an old friend, uh, who has um, a classical uh, stone printing uh, workshop in in Abelsoft in Jutland. L- lithography, right? Yeah, yeah, and um, and. So it's I have this setup in spring and in autumn uh, where I travel for two weeks doing this production. Let's say I want to go to Reykjavik. So I have this newsletter sending out to all my, uh, what's the word? Um, um, Friends and clients. Yeah, you know, people who are interested. <laughs> people who want yeah, to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, saying that I'm going to Reykjavik, I'm making these three prints and... Uh, with the motif that has something to do with Iceland, Reykjavik, something in that direction. And uh, you can buy this now and get it cheaper than when I'm finished and, and, the, and the shit is getting on the market. So it's like uh, what you nowadays call is called uh, crowdfunding. Right. It's like Kickstarter or something. Yeah. Yeah. But before we did it before it was, it was that, but, Actually, it's the way you always have, uh, uh, you know, collected money to make a movie. It's uh, right. with uh, the manuscript you're, right. you're selling, not the movie. Right. And so, and I have done this many years now. So, and uh, so it's it's like going somewhere, doing, uh, you know, I'm renting an apartment or renting a house, and uh, my printmaker is just making a print workshop in the kitchen. Because the kitchen is a good workspace. There's water and it's stable. It has the right high, all this. And then we just do what we would do in uh, in his uh, professional uh, 
uh, uh, workshop. Uh, But back, you're not doing lithography, home. right? No, we are doing then Lionel cut and uh, right portable. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. different techniques, but mm. it's still just graphic, and uh, it's it takes three times as long to do it in the hand by hand, uh, which we have, which we do, right. and uh, but it's no problem actually. And uh, but in the same time, it's um, all this traveling is. Um, Uh, what is the English word? You know, when we go to Madrid or somewhere, we we just seek out all, out all the museums, all uh, all the history of art. It's research, exactly. All the galleries, and you know, and then now after all these years, I really know a lot about where the art in Europe is. Mm. Where's the Matisse? Where's the Picasso? What are they doing? What are the the artists in these different countries? That's valuable. And so I'm trying to figure out what is Europe. Mm. And um, so it, and it makes me it makes me able to travel places where I wouldn't go. Let's say Helsinki, uh, or maybe not that often go. So I'm right. about to figure out what you, what Europe is about in in, uh, in on the art scene and uh, as a whole. What is Europe? That is valuable knowledge, both to you and to other people. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's it's about about all kinds of things. Like language that which we were. I mean, we are we two. We have both have two languages. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my German Danish, and you have your American Danish. And uh, just to understand how the language works in these countries makes you understand a lot more about the countries. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, absolutely. I really like that. What about? Um, I kind of wanted to ask you about the show you just had. Yeah. Because I uh, I was introduced to your work in the way that I usually am introduced to work, which is that it comes to the shop I used to work at for framing. Yeah. And that is both good because I get access to artworks before they end up being shown and stuff. But it's also bad because I don't actually see what the exhibition design is or get the press release or anything else. So I can sometimes look at art and be like, oh, okay, um, that's what this is. You know, and then I'll go to the show and be like, oh, oh uh, yeah, that's what this is, you know, because <laughs> yeah. maybe not oh, everything yeah. was being framed or oh, yeah. just the way you hang it up. And that happened to me with your show. Yeah. When I went there, I, it just it went bing and I went, oh, damn it. That's what this is about. Yeah, you know, you are just seeing all this cardboard. I was seeing all these very bright colored paintings on cardboard yeah. and I had no idea what the story was. And yeah. of course, when I saw the story, I, got, I became very interested. Yeah. Um. Can you tell 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 us a little bit about what the story is and how that exhibition came to be? Yeah, well, it's it's in, in the basic, it's very simple. It has in on the material side, it has you know my history with cardboard, which which was the material that I chose for this reason that it was cheap and there was you know was that was sold. And now you're used. Now that's your thing. Yeah, but it wasn't planned like that. I mean, it's, it's just happening the way that you, when you are looking into things you don't know anything about, you will often experience that it's just opening and opening and opening and opening new possibilities all the time yeah. that you can, had never, uh, could never figure out before. You just have to go there to find it. Yeah. It's like going a new path that you I know a new way you have never gone before, and it's the first time you just see it. It's mm. just the way it is, yeah. and. I thought only, you know, when I started up doing this sculpture, uh, cardboard sculpture, it was really just because the material was cheap and I could use it. And, and then slowly I, I found out, wow, this material has all kinds of qualities. There's, you know, all kinds of information printed on it. And as a, as a graf former graphic designer, I'm still, you know, have the sickness and love for <laughs> For books and for for no for the alphabet and all these things, so that was a whole world there. Right. The material and all that it, that it could, uh, you know, and it's just somehow constantly open to new possibilities. Yeah. So for me, painting on cardboard now on this show, which we are talking about, the thing about that was that it, it represented a a kind of uh, you know canvas that was not from a ground zero. It was. It had kind of personality uh, because it was. You know, when you take a, a cardboard fruit box and just opens it up, like make, lays it flat out, mm -hmm. it has all these uh, 
what's the word? All the forms and bends. Yeah, you and know, and kinks. they have all kinds of holes. Uh, that are in, especially in these uh, fruit boxes, there are all kinds of holes right, so the that handles. the fruit uh, doesn't uh, get bad, so oh, they get air, so, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it depends on which kind of fruit it has. So many holes, mm. and of course for for the hand, uh, what did you the call handles? It? Yeah, the handles. Yeah. And so when you do, when you take such a box and just lay it flat, and then just either you just you know paint it white and say this is now my my canvas, or you don't paint it white and say this is my canvas. You have you have already some kind of what could we call it? Some kind of uh, basic uh, layout or right. So there's kind constrictions, of, uh, there's rules, yeah, there's this there, shape, there's that. There are something. It's yeah. like working in the street. You know, the, right. the difference between working in the street and working in the white cube is in the white cube you are God in the new world. Right. And you work in the street, it's totally opposite. You just playing a ball up against a wall full of meaning. Right. And that's the same with this. Uh, so you have this cardboard thing. They you can uh, sometimes I pick up a box because I like the colors and think, wow, these colors is just great. I'll make a painting with these colors myself. I'll use some of it and some of it I'll just paint over. Mm. But using these colors is my motivation for taking this box. Oh, it's just uh, the holes. I like the holes. I like uh, the thing that it is not only a 2D thing, it's a, a three-dimensional thing now. It's it's. Uh, a canvas, but it's also an object, and you can you can be uh, you can you know when you just see it, you're not sure which is holes and which is just uh, white circles that you painted. So right. there's all kinds of visual uh, possibilities in it. So I like this idea of that uh, you know I have some kind of uh, material that already has a, a own personality or uh, own history or something that it's it's like being in a band or in a duo somehow you know you're playing along with a blind uh, date or something right right you know? right and um, so yeah and you saw all, the, all this uh, cardboard in your shop and the other thing is uh, when I well this was a very simple uh, show it was painting only and two kinds of paintings, the cardboard paintings and then the paintings on canvas. And with, uh, what I did on the canvas side to have this same kind of uh, uh, starting point with, the, with uh, some kind of layout is that I took all these, um, all these uh, rests, rest pieces, leftovers. leftovers of cardboard that I had developed, uh, no, collected mm -hmm. over the years and just sewed them together. And uh, with these, uh, uh, what's the word again? You know, there's right the seam. That's the what it's seam, called. The seam, yeah. I just, uh, you know, put the seam outwards, uh, so it has like. Uh, right, visually, you can just see that join. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, uh, yes, some kind of a uh, uh, formalistic uh, piece of work from from the from the thirties or something. Right, you right, know, right. from the beginning. So you again, you have this layout. You have this kind of. Uh, um, all kinds of problems <laughs> that you have to overcome. I just right. love them, you know. Yeah. And again, it's a it's a kind of sculptural thing mm. because when you paint on that on it, it, it gets all kinds of problems and uh, and all kinds of. Uh, it's almost like you when you paint on this kind of canvas and you have this have this first. Uh, shot and you don't like it and you paint it over and you don't like that either and you paint it over again every time there will just be some of what you did before on the canvas because of this design right so uh, you look at at the same time at, at different paintings in the same painting or versions right because uh, when you go to the side or one side or the other it looks different because there are all kinds of leftovers mm. uh, from the, the uh, your first takes or second takes uh, so it's maybe it's a little like jazz mus music you have different takes of the same idea right and I like that thing also with yeah but the idea behind all this was actually just totally naive and totally basic symbol to try to build up a more uh, more um, uh, abstract language than I have painted before and uh, so I did uh, I did this um, exercise for myself finding uh, a motif uh, that I could paint again and again and just uh, deconstructing it more and more and more and make it you know this 
I mean, it's all done before, but it's still so interesting, and there's so still so much new things to gain there. And um, um, I mean, you can see Picasso's uh, deconstructing paintings of Velasquez. Uh, right. What do I know? Francis Bacon doing Van Gogh, uh, right, 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 and so on and so forth. And it's just great. It's just uh, being in a gymnastic room and doing this kind of uh, what's the word? Uh, but exercise, workout, yeah. exercise, exactly. And yeah. so that was that was my simple plan. And I chose this uh, this Van Gogh old painting from the eighteen eighties, uh, the the room and all, uh, which he which he did the free version of himself. Mm-hmm. Roy Lichtenstein has done that as well. Mm, mm. And I just starting painting the same picture again and again and just trying to deconstruct it and trying to do it in different ways. And uh, it was really, really nice to do. And at the same time, when you, sh- when you are having a show like that, it's very easy for people to understand what is going on here. And, um, you know, so it's it has this... Uh, What's the word? Pedagogic, pedagogic, uh, pedagogical. Yeah, kind of approach. Also, you, you know, you can, you can, people can see. Okay, here's a window, and next time it's right. It's more abstract, and it ends up being a totally abstract form. That this form is now a window. Like an A is an A. You wouldn't know it before you learned it. Right. And uh, so it was. Uh, it's like being in the gym in a very easy. Um, Right, and you can follow the process and kind of the, the the line through the exhibition. Yeah. So it was really, you know, what is a line? What is a circle? What can we do with mm. the, this color, that color? And so totally basic way. Why did you call it La, Ch- La Chambre? Yeah, I just, uh, uh, yeah, I had to call it. You always have to call your exhibition something. You do indeed. And uh, and uh, I I didn't know what to call it actually. To to be honest, uh, the the my gallerist said. Well, why just call it? Uh, why should we just call it La Chambre? The room. Yeah, the room. Yeah, but it, it, because that was my main focus, and of mm-hmm. course, there are all kinds of side stories and so. But that was uh, the main focus. Just well, trying to develop an and kind of language that was, you know, between this figurative and non-figurative thing. That yeah. was my language. Right. Yeah. The thing about the show you made here was that it worked really, really well as a show. You know, like I was saying earlier, that thing about seeing them individually and then seeing them together. Um, You know, and that's kind of the problem with making exhibitions because if it goes to a gallery, then they get sold off one by one, unless somehow you're lucky enough to get a a museum or someone to buy the whole thing. You know, does it is it hard for you to see it get split up like that then? No, I wouldn't say. I have this strange feeling about my work in that way that I, I'm, I'm. For me, it's interesting to do. When I have done the piece, I'm really not attached to it. Just get out of here. Yeah, I, I, really, I, mean, I mean, it's. I, I don't. I don't care about it in that way anymore. I mean, it's for me. Then I can, you know, it's just. Then it's just a business. Mm. Uh, I, I like to to talk about it and uh, you know all these things, but I don't. I don't have to own it uh but i can see a, a you know i'm i i was glad that when when people come i mean new Carlsberg fund came and bought six of the biggest canvases in one take and and i know they will you know uh, take care of them in a good way and of course it's it's nice to have the uh, the story in one but actually in in real life there are only two places where you have this thing or free it's uh, when you open the show and maybe when you're doing a retro, right? When they the collect museum, it all again, or in the books, yeah. Elsewhere, it doesn't it doesn't exist, and, and, and unless you are really guess really really rich and buying twelve pieces and right. hanging them up, which I guess not so often. Right, that's <laughs> I don't just know. That's something else. <laughs> no, but, but I, mean, I mean, yeah, and, it, and so the the this when I did the show, I was for the first time really aware of the problem that we talked about earlier that you can just you know, yes you can but you have some problems when you doing this and then next year you do that and i have done this for years and years and years and i thought right. well I, I maybe i should just you know uh 
focus on more on a more simple thing also because now i have tried lots of things out and i'm i'm much more aware of what i want to do now because i did what i guess you folks that you have gone to the art academy would do there just trying this and trying that and figure out what the hell it is yeah so i did this for 10 years without going there but just being in business doing the same thing right and um But that's not so good for business. and uh, <laughs> Or and, fun. Uh, it's not good for fun either. No, it's, it has a lot of problems. So, But, I mean, it has to be like that. When you, right. uh, any, uh, no matter how you start, it is, I guess it's just the way you have to have be in a, a kind of in some years where you just have to figure out what the hell is this. Right. Who are you? Right. That and, can be hard. Uh, what can you do? And, yeah, so... That is just the normal thing to do, I guess. And uh, so, but when I opened the show, I had the the privilege also to give out, bring out this great big book about what I did the last 15, 16 years. Right. And that's what I wanted to mention because I don't think that you necessarily should uh, should stop, you know, going different directions because it wasn't until I opened your book that I really started to get. The universe that you work in. Yeah. And it was all interesting and attractive. Because again, the problem with working in the framing industry is you only see the 2D works. I didn't know, you know, I don't come from Denmark, so I didn't know anything about your history on the street. I didn't know anything about the, the life-size tractor you've made out of cardboard or the <laughs> car, uh, the power <laughs> tools you've made out of track, out of cardboard, you know, all this stuff. And it, it immediately was like, oh shit, there's this whole world, you know, yeah. that he's working in. And that's, That I think was very, very. It's it's one of the stronger parts of your work. To be honest, I wouldn't. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't say you should just make paintings on flat cardboard from now on out. You know, because no, no, you no. have your thing, and you have also a style and a direction that keeps different. Uh, whether it's more sculptural or more painting, like it keeps it all in a line. Yeah. You know, there is a through line you can see. Just get yeah. the book. Yeah. Look at the book. You can see there's a, yeah. you're doing it's, your thing. A book is just a perfect thing. It isn't really it? is. It's, it's so great. I mean, you can really just so simple. Here I am. This is what I did. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's so effective. Yeah. And it's also good, I imagine, for you to look back. It is. And and kind of see your work in, in a compiled, compressed form. Exactly. And, and, it's, so, and kind of, it's so good for communication. Mm. And uh, the strange thing is that, that as soon as you are putting your work in a book, it exists. Mm. You know? It's real. It's real. <laughs> now, now it is real. Yeah. It, it's so strange <laughs> because also when you work in the street, uh, the, the way most people work in the street, and I definitely did it. I mean, my sculpture of things was only like, let's say, a life an hour. Right. And maybe 10 people have seen it right. in real life. And then I make my photo, and then it becomes a story. Right. So it's the same idea traveling in different medias. Mm. But the first media is only there for like an hour. Then it will never come back. Right. So it's, it. it's very... Uh, and that is also a thing I love so much about making the work out in public space that the the same idea is just traveling from media to media and so you start off having a sculpture in the street and uh, a kind of happening uh, people see it uh, people comment it and things like that and then it gets taken a photo and then the sculpture is get thrown out and then you have the photo and then some of my sculptures have an afterlife that is so fucking crazy we don't have time to talk about this now but They have a really great hi- hi- histories, a lot of these uh, sculptures, uh, kind of afterlife. Right, and stuff happens to them. And then it becomes a kind of story. Right. And you know, like, the nature of story is to getting better every time it's getting into a mouth in a good storyteller. So, so some of the stories about the thing I made is so fantastic and, and so unreal, <laughs> you know? But that's what that media is good to about. I mean, it's telling stories, telling stories is about making the stories better right. and better. So uh, this is it's really a funny journey. Right. Uh, well, it makes it. I, I kind of w- thought about your work this morning as I was thinking about it before you got here, as in a way as poetry, and as language, and and you seem to like you make these things. You package them and then you deliver them to the world like you'd read a poem or make a book of poetry. And then after that, it's in the world and you can no longer control it. 
Yeah, exactly. You'd set sail. Yeah. Bon viaggio. Yeah. Have a nice trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we'll that, see yeah. what happens. Exactly. That too. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing is what you say. It's, it's like it, it becomes uh, when as soon as I have uh, you know put it somewhere, it's everybody's. So mm. now it's just a, a project for everyone. Mm. And uh, and so, but I always thought a little about it. I mean, as a as with my background as an illustrator and a cartoon drawer and all this, it's it's just like having a comment. Mm. A daily drawing, right, right, on right. a newspaper. You know, oh, this space. If I do put this on, what is happening then? You know, when I add this sculpture into this, often I did, for example, sculptures to other sculptures, mm. uh, right, like the one in Aros. Yeah, like the one in Aros. Uh, I, I did some in, in Central Park in New York too, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. different places, and and uh, you know, but always just for uh, one hour or something, right. you know. And that's why the book's so good because it really yeah. lets you walk through yeah. your journey yeah. with that. And that's the only way to present it. Really, it is because it doesn't exist anymore. So we started with the uh, with now. We might as well end with now. Can you say anything about what you're going to do, or is it still totally uh, from now on? Yeah, what's no, next? I have different projects actually. I, I I'm. I have uh, you know museum shows and and a gallery show coming up next year. And oh I shit! Have, I was saying you had all this time to relax. You don't at all, huh? No, you never have time <laughs> to relax. No, <laughs> and uh, and then I have um, what's it called um, com- commission mm-hmm, to a mm-hmm. new uh, and total new sujuhus um, um, for a new hospital. For a new hospital, it's going to be built now. Okay. And I did some of. I, I started doing commissions two years ago, um, mostly murals, and uh, yeah. So I, I. That's another world. That's the more permanent street art. Yeah, very it's totally good. different. I feel much more like a designer when I'm doing that because yeah. I mean, when you're doing your shit in the gallery, you don't care what people think because they can just go, or leave, or come, go, whatever they want. But but when you're doing it like in, let's say in a hospital. It, for me, at least, it's important that these people like what I did because they can't get away from it. Right. And then, uh, so it's more like a kind of a designer's work in some some way. Right. I guess you go back to your graphic design toolkit in that case. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Your communication. Yeah, it is sort of different mm. approach, and but I like it. Mm. I think it's interesting. All right. Yeah. Well, I think I, I, you know, I want to reiterate again that people should get your book because that's what really opened the door for me and changed, uh, and and made let me understand what it is you do because I'm not from here, you know. So anybody who's not from Denmark, it's important to get a little bit of an overview and see what's going on, you know, or at least follow the journey. So I think that's important. Um, and uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Me too. All right, thank you for listening to this episode of the Undergang Armchair. Intro and outro music was kindly provided by Johnny Ripper, and today's interstitial music was provided by David Hyde. You can find links to their music and tons of other conversations with great people on our temporal time warp of a website, undergang.net. If you like the show, we would really appreciate it if you'd take the time to leave a review on iTunes so others can find us. The show is produced in part with the kind support of the Danish Arts Council. Thank you for joining us. Buy Saran's book, and we'll see you at the Code Art Fair next week.